Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Community Hour. It's finally Sunday, the day we've been all waiting for. Breathlessly, I know, is here. It's the Community Hour. Um, we had a lot of fun with the one uh, last week and got a, just a great discussion going with everybody. Um, that was one of my favorite ones we've done so far, and I think this is going to be a really fun one today. Mm -hmm. um, we've already got some great folks in the room. Uh, New York Redneck, always good to see you, and Frecklebeard, Mary mm -hmm. Flash, good to see you. Uh, she found it on Facebook. There. Um, we've been getting the Sovereign Village Project thing going on website a little on uh, Facebook a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a lot of us are kind of dialing out of Facebook. I know I'm kind of headed out of Facebook, but right now as a content creator, I still use it a little bit. Um, so I'm still there, and it's still kind of useful as far as groups are concerned. Um, but obviously, that's got a shelf life with all of the, the censorship and everything on Facebook. But mm -hmm. for now, we're on there. And Mary, I know Mary found us over there. And uh, good to see you in here. Uh, so, yeah, looks like we got a good start in here in the room, everybody. Uh, if you hit, if you like the video and that kind of thing and comment on it, that just drives it up and more folks see it. We're always in this eternal battle with the algorithm. So yeah. mm -hmm. um, we'll see what we can sneak by them today. Uh, but today's topic is pretty fun. What would we officially call it? I think how to, or making your homestead profitable. Yeah. So to me, if your homestead is not providing for all of your financial needs eventually, or at least enough of your financial needs, then you're not really self-sufficient. Um, a big key to self-sufficiency is not relying on a job um, or an external employer. Um, as we saw what happened with the, with the, uh, the masking and the forced closures, like business will target, uh, government will target businesses and they will extract compliance via your employment. They will use your employment as basically a hostage. They will hold your employment and your ability to make a living. They will hold that hostage to make you do things you don't want to do. So yeah. the only way to avoid that going forward, because obviously it works so well during this that they're mm -hmm. going to do it more. The only way to move forward is to be self-sufficient financially. And so we really believe that the homestead is key to that, that your homestead is an asset. If it's not an asset, it's a liability. Yeah. And that means that it's taking money away from It's hurting your self-sufficiency. If, if your home does not make you money, in all its various forms, then it's a detriment. It's it's hurting your ability to survive and thrive in these times. So it's crucial that we make our homesteads into revenue generating systems. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people kind of start and end that conversation with like, what am I growing? And and that's often kind of doomed for failure. They'll make they'll work so hard to sell things off their farm, and you know they'll make some kind of money or profit, but it's like the the labor does not pay for the output and um, I think that's often due to inefficiencies in the system but I think we need to expand our thinking beyond just what we're growing yeah um, because we all have passions and we all have interests and in the things that we're good at and things we like doing and the homestead should be a vehicle by which you sell those things by which you sell the services that you you want to do and you sell mm -hmm. the crafts that you create um, and so when you think of your homestead for us a tractor or a fruit tree or a piece of recording equipment is all the same thing. That's all an investment into an asset that will produce income on our property. Um, so like a microphone may seem like an unconventional thing to consider an investment on your homestead, but that's for our content creation. That's for me as a musician. I can do recording and get revenue from um, doing recording sessions or doing more content online as a musician or doing lessons online, things like that. So. When you really sit down and brainstorm out all of your interests, you can start to think about how can my homestead be designed to attract money into the things I like to do. Um, to attract money and to attract eyes and mm -hmm. um, audiences. Yes. So I think also um, using your homestead as sort of a what what we would call in marketing a lead generation magnet. So finding different products within your homestead that maybe offer an experience that allows for someone to interact with you on a kind of a free basis, whether that's, you know, doing a video on YouTube um, or giving, you know, giving out a free coupon for 10% off yeah. your, your products or something, whatever that is. Um, thinking of creative ways to market your products and to also bring people into your bigger ecosystem, I guess, or into your own ecosystem. In case you haven't figured out, Gabby is truly an expert in this stuff. Um, her experience as a marketer, she's worked in marketing in the belly of the beast, so to say, <laughs> and her experience there is invaluable. And one of the main things, themes that's going to run through our content here and in Finding Country, especially Finding Country, mm -hmm. is going to be all taking all of that marketing experience and applying it to the homestead, applying it to the things you produce. From our permaculture perspective, we want to just basically sell all of the things that we naturally produce an abundance of. So 
our business, our farm, when we're referring to just like what we're selling off of the actual, like the actual plants and animals we're selling, we're just selling the surplus. We're growing the diversest group of things that we possibly can, mm -hmm. the easiest things. So we're focusing on animals and plants that are easy and we plant them diversely and things that are low maintenance and hands off, but growing as much of that as we can. And then we develop a marketing system that is that works with that variability because one year we might have a great tomato year. Yeah. The next year we might have a great hickory nut year. You know, yeah. it, it can vary so widely. And we want to build a sales system that works for that variability because otherwise we're falling into the old trap of, okay, I'm exclusively to a tomato available. salesman and, and yeah, I always have to have tomatoes available. So I need to throw up a giant greenhouse and I need to spray away the bugs and I need to have a monoculture. And then we're back to the same destructive, degenerative agriculture that is destroying our and country and our world. Yeah, and maybe it becomes less enjoyable for you yeah. too, which yeah. you don't want. If if something's not enjoyable for you, you're not going to continue doing it as a business. And when you have a system like that that you can sell diversely, you're insulated from so many problems. You know, this has been a really hard growing year in Tennessee for a lot of people because it's been a very cool May. Normally May gets really hot, and then you get your tomatoes and your peppers and a lot of these typical crops in the ground. And I've heard heard a lot of locals complaining about like not being able to garden yet. We've got a massively abundant garden yeah. outside right now because we do more of a succession planting thing where it's like absolutely anything that seems like it's going to do in cooler weather, we start planting before we should be able to. Before, yeah. we, like, we just accept our losses to frost. We're like, because okay, we'll just keep planting. We'll just keep yeah. planting. If it Seeds doesn't germinate true. within yeah. the, you know, time, the kind of time frame, then we'll you just yeah. plant it. <laughs> and so that constant diversity, if you can find a way to sell that in all aspects, so not just um, your food, but like, for example, Maybe I'm making chicken tractors and I have and I found it I found a good style I like and I order some materials in bulk. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have three or four chicken tractors extra worth of materials. I might as well just make those and sell those out front in front of my house or something, you know, at 300, 400 bucks a pop. Um, you want to build a reputation and a crew of people, of customers who know that you provide good quality, good things and good services and that mm -hmm. you're a good person. And you want to like when you build that reputation. And you have a large following of people who pay attention to what you're putting out, whether that's through social media or through a farm stand or some other things we'll talk about. Um, that diversity allows you to have this more relaxed approach to selling the things that you produce in abundance instead of trying yeah. to focus on selling the things that are maybe harder to produce. If that makes sense. Oh, um, I want to uh, point out. Um, well, that's William. Uh, he says, hello, Gabby and Matt. Um, he's been watching these on replay, but he's happy to be here live. William helps me. William edit the Finding Country Oh, magazine. yes, yes. So, well, it's been awesome. Yeah. So um, he's been great and met him actually through Sovereign Really Project. Yeah, <laughs> so, I, I look forward enough. to meeting William in person too. Yeah, it's gonna be mm -hmm. great. yeah but he's in, he's in Tennessee too, just a, a little further from us. But I'm glad to I'm glad you caught us live here, mm -hmm. <laughs> William. Yeah, it's been. And uh, Frecklebury says, where can we find your music? Yeah. Um, I'm actually really working on revamping all of my music. I've been doing everything the typical way on Spotify and, and um, iTunes and all of that, but as I switch into more major agorist mode here, um, I'm switching around a lot of my systems to where I can kind of exclusively sell with cryptocurrency, um, things like that. But for now, I've got stuff still up. It's just matthundley.com. That's my website. Um, and I've got some here on YouTube, too, if you just search my name, Matt Hundley. Live from a single wide is the last album. Mm -hmm. You can probably find that there. But um, I'm going to start a new album here soon, and I'll, and I'll, I'll talk about it if we still have a real project because, you know, it's, it's a personal channel as well. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to actually, the music delivery system is going to be something I'm going to cover on this channel because I'm going to talk about ways to sell intellectual property. But anyway, let's jump back into this. So making your homestead make money. So of course you should be selling the surplus of whatever you have. You can go through and, and by selling, we may not just be talking about cash here. Um, it's really important to understand the other forms of capital. We've all kind of been almost brainwashed to think that financial capital is the is the end all when it comes to currencies that we just got to hoard these little pieces of paper that we're told have value where in reality that's not how billionaires really think. people have value not and many things have value right. and there's other forms of capital that are just as real just as tangible maybe more actually far more tangible than fiat currency certainly fiat currency doesn't actually have any value you could argue that it's not capital it's merely an accounting system like blockchain technology um but let's real quick talk about the before we can talk about how to make money on your homestead Let's talk about, first of all, what does that mean, make money? Because I'm using that in like a traditional sense, but when you start expanding your thinking beyond financial capital, you can be way more successful and far wealthier. So um, the old, the, the, uh, there's eight forms of capital in the permaculture mindset that have been popularized. Um, the first would be financial capital, that's money. Um, sort of that's precious metals, that would be cryptocurrencies. Um, 
again, I would argue that it's actually not capital. It's an accounting system. It has mm -hmm. no value. Gold has value. Silver has value. Um, but fiat currency doesn't really have value except as an accounting system. But anyway, that's one form of capital. And we kind of think that's the only form of capital, but um, it's not. So the next one would be intellectual capital. Intellectual capital is... Uh, yeah, I guess that's one that's also, well, it's knowledge. Um, yeah, it's basically, yeah, um, the, the knowledge you acquire in your brain. Some people would define it as also like the content you create. Yeah. Um, which is a lot of what we do. Um, material capital would be things on the ground. A barn is material capital. It will generate revenue for you. So it right. produces value. It will keep, it will produce meat for you if you have meat animals in there. Um a timber on the ground, lumber right now, especially that's capital, um, a bunch of rocks. That's material capital. Resources. Gold, I would actually classify as material capital because it's a material that's useful. Its value is in its use. Now its value surpasses that because of its you know limited nature, but um, material capital could be really anything non-living that's material. Um, and so I'm always trying to amass those kinds of things. If I'm digging out rocks out of the garden, if they're good sized rocks, I'm setting those aside because I'll build a wall or an herb spiral or something out of those. That's yeah. capital. That's real mm -hmm. capital. And like I look at some of the projects I do with just those free rocks and look at what it would cost to bring in concrete or something. And I, it can be hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so these things are real and they're tangible and they can really make a difference in your finances. Mm -hmm. uh, social capital is a huge one. Social capital is the, the, the money of the elites, really. That's what they mm -hmm. use as social mm -hmm. capital is – you know, I'll do you a favor. You do me a favor. Um, but it doesn't need to be quite that. It can, it can also be that or it can be like, uh, for example, we're involved in volunteer organizations mm -hmm. or I'm using uh, my marketing and, and social media and communications experience to help with a local um, festival. And I'm making, you know, kind of these intangible connections within. Intangible connections. In intangible, yeah, connections within the community. Um that are not necessarily based on like me doing a favor for you. You do, you know, we're all kind of working towards one common goal. So it's, yeah. it's less. And, and that's um, actually tangibly paid off. Like um, you've been helping with marketing for um, a kind of a tourism thing to help pr promote tourism out in this rural area. Mm -hmm. And in exchange, they've allowed her to work at the co-working space that's in a small town near us for mm -hmm. free. Yeah. So that that's a real value that we need, you know, good internet and printing. And we don't really have a printer here. So that's a real thing of real value that she's been I given for free and, because yeah. of the things she's done. That's truly social capital. Yeah, that's, I, that's me saving two hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Just so you know. when I, you know, when I'm pl I play, play with a lot of other people besides doing my own music in downtown Nashville. When I play, I do the best. Show up on time. I do the best job yeah. that I can, and and I try to be a good hang. You know, somebody to, that's pleasant to be around. And as a result, people call me because they know what and I'm going to provide and they refer me and that's social capital. It's invaluable. And there's a billion ways to build social capital, but uh, let's keep moving through these. Uh, living capital would be like Holly. <laughs> Holly is living capital, not the most useful, but um, she does provide us with service. She's a, a security dog. Not like she's going to bite anybody's head off, but she, she barks lets and know. lets us know when cars are pulling mm -hmm. in um, more of a companionship thing really. But uh, a rabbit or a cow is living capital. I would argue that compost is living capital. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that's almost your like that's the root of all your wealth is compost. Yeah. <laughs> um, some people would say, well, the way society is moving is that humans are going to be living capital. Kids um, could be living capital in a way. Yeah, kid, well, <laughs> traditionally in agrarian societies, yeah. kids are absolutely that's that's actually why overpopulation occurs in third world countries is because they're still really agrarian. But there's also a lot of poverty. There's not abundance. And so children are seen as like, OK, this is who's going to provide for me when I get old. If you don't have like government services to do that, then family is what does that. And, and they're helping with like intangible chores, chores like even, you know, yeah. taking care of the dog or taking uh, care on of a, animals. Yeah, and... exactly. Like a, like a child is made to raise a dog, really. Um, uh, on a darker note, you know, that can be seen as like as they kind of use combine more centralized blockchain technology with this carbon agenda and they quantify carbon to a number and say, okay, your yeah, worth is the amount of carbon. And then extreme. you can buy and sell a human. That's where things are going with that kind of agenda. So um, living capital, has, you know, all of this can be misused as well as it can be used. Um, experiential capital, that would be going out and learning and you do something with your hands. You slaughter a chicken. Now you know how to slaughter a chicken. Yeah. Basically, build a barn. Yeah. That's maybe, invaluable. Yeah. And maybe like even using your intellectual capital to create yeah. Intellectual and ca capital and experiential are so and much then, similar. Yeah. In a lot, in a lot of yeah. ways, I think they're kind of like indistinguishable. They're kind of like 
they kind of play off of each other. And those other. are the only ones that really can't be taken away unless you get hit on the head and lose all brain function. Like that's yeah. the best prep I think really is experiential and intellectual capital is you get things in your brain that are useful. It doesn't matter which invading army and which era mm -hmm. of humanity marches through. If you're a guy that knows how to garden really well, yeah. or you know how to patch people up and you're, you're good at medical things, like they're not well, going to kill and you. This, and this is why like we really prioritize buying books and finding, you know, free books and stuff like that, because to us, that's an, an investment. And it's free. Like here's YouTube for all of the negative yeah. things about YouTube. What an incredible source to build that kind of capital. A um, couple more here. Cultural capital would be, that's something you can't amass as an individual. That's capital that you only, a specific community can uniquely and collectively mm -hmm. create. Um, so for example, a lot of cultures, they'll encode knowledge within songs. A lot of our common nursery rhymes, Ring Around the Rosie and stuff like that. Actually Pox full of posy. Posies were thought to be a cure. Um, and maybe they did have a lot of important, you know, immune boosting. I haven't really researched that. But um, that nursery rhyme, it's a cultural trope. It's a cultural thing that was created by just being passed down um, auditorily. And it, create, it had real knowledge in it um, that was very valuable. And that was created by culture. Um, it gets harder and kind of intangible to talk about capital. So I'll just leave that there. I don't want to get too into the woods here. And the last would be spiritual capital. Um, I would say that's a very real tangible form of capital when the way the world things going mm -hmm. are going like your belief in God and in there being in, in goodness winning this bad is, is maybe what's going to carry a lot of people through. Um, it's the, it's the real thing that carries you through hard times when a lot of people will give up and people that give up don't succeed. So it's a real form of capital just like any other. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing all of those forms of capital, when you look at your homestead as a as a capital generating machine, mm -hmm. that's how you should look at it because all of those are, are just as important. Um, you need a lot of financial capital. That is, that's an important tool to be able to exchange for goods that you need to bring in. However, you can store it in the other forms. I might store it. And if it's in the other forms, of course, you can barter. So my living, you know, I could trade Holly for maybe a dog that doesn't chew so loudly during videos. Um, <laughs> I can I can trade a rabbit um, for a rain barrel, you know, so I can directly yeah. barter. But that's obviously not high, that efficient. So it's useful to have some kind of financial capital as an exchange. So you should see that, though, is just keeping enough on hand to do. You shouldn't really store your wealth in because most of that it's a liability. Most financial capital, like especially fiat, loses value. You don't want to store too much money in that. So you want to store it in your materials or store it in your intellectual capital or your social capital, or your living capital. Um, you know, we're pouring all of our, cause fiat is hyperinflating so fast right now. We want to get rid of it. We just want enough for basic savings. So we're throwing everything into the house, everything into the homestead, everything into animals, um, everything into perennial trees yeah. and living capital roots and in the ground, infrastructure, infrastructure yeah. that's useful. Some of that material. Capital. And all that stuff will bring us more, that can still bring us in more financial capital, um, through both the sale of it and through whatever it produces. For example, a fruit tree is producing fruit and I can get financial capital from that. I can give it to my neighbors and get social capital. Right now, the amount of food we're producing, it's not that, you know, it's only about 20 to 25% of our diet. So any leftovers we have, we just give away at the moment. You know, occasionally yeah. we'll sell something at a, at a little sale. Mostly we're, we're focusing on the social capital uh, aspect of it. But like social capital has already got us through some pretty tough times this last year. Yeah. So it's, it's not to be, it's like realize the importance of financial capital, but realize the importance of the others. Um, so let's get to some comments here really quick. And then let's talk about all the different ways that we're planning on monetizing our new homestead and what we're already doing. Yeah. But uh, there's too many great uh, mm -hmm. comments here. Hey, Perma Pastors in the house. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, Mary says a bartering community is what I've been working on. Yeah. I'd love to know more about that. Um, bartering is so much fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a great way, you know, the tax man doesn't need to know about it most of the mm -hmm. time. Um, and it's a, it's a great agorist method. Mary's also, I got thrown in jail nonstop and on Facebook. Yeah, I've been, I spent a lot of time in the Facebook joint. It'll change a man. Um, human farming is an elitist profession. Yes, uh, we are absolutely in their eyes. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's absurd to believe that people who uh, whose families have been at the top of society for many generations, to believe that they suddenly stopped believing in slavery. They, they never stopped believing in slavery. They see you as capital, you know. You've got a birth certificate that's will probably continue to evolve to really state your value one of these days, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. I, I've done enough rabbit holes on these videos. <laughs> we're going to set it aside. I swear we're going to do it. We're going to do a rabbit hole video and just deep dive into conspiracy theories and stuff. But um, 
certainly the elite of the world see you as just like the way they would say cattle or gold or an oil well. You're just a, yeah. an asset or, or you're a liability. And if you're a liability, um, they're going to get rid of that. Um, but yeah, that's that's never changed. Marielle says, I'm considering doing courses on making colloidal silver. I would get in on that. I was just hearing something about colloidal silver for um, helping propagate cannabis plants. I need to research more about that. I know of the medicinal properties as well. It can be very useful uh, for medicinal purposes. Colloidal silver is pretty, pretty cool stuff. So, yeah, I would love to see that class. I, I myself would tune into that. Mm -hmm. Turning Guns says, young people, cool. <laughs> now, I don't know if Turning Guns is somebody um, that came through, but uh, a few people came through from uh, a bunch of people, actually. Freedom Inc., thank you very much for the shout-out, Freedom Inc., and Special Operations Equipment, um, who I just discovered. He sent a bunch of people over to the channel, and I just saw his channel. It looks really cool, Special Operations Equipment. So, And it turns out him and soon-to-be Freedom Inc., he's moving out here, uh, spe Special Operations Equipment. They're, they're neighbors in neighboring counties. So we're starting – obviously, we're going to try to meet up with everybody, and – we're building such a cool network of like-minded people out here and I'm really excited. And this will play into what we're talking about, mon you know, monetizing homestead. One of the things we need to be doing is building trade networks as well. And everyone who's got the same mindset, who's like really trying to get financially self-sufficient, we can all be supporting each other and building really strong networks that will weather any kind of a storm. And that's going to be crucial. The, the first one to build a trade network and collapse wins. <laughs> um, so we got a few more comments. Oh yeah, uh, William says smash that like button. Yeah, that does really help um, uh, get Push it up there in the algorithm. algorithm. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's go back to what we're talking about here, which is how are how are we now and how are we planning to monetize? And when I say monetize, I'm referring to all the forms of, of we kind of don't distinguish of capital. Um, what are we planning on doing? So. What are our interests, first of all, and what, mm -hmm. what resources do we have right now? It's kind of the framework we use. Yeah, so yeah. We always start with what we're interested in, in doing. So why don't you go first, say, just your interests and skills and things that you have now in terms of assets, and then we'll talk about how we're... All right. I'll start with skills, so... And I'll tell mine before we tell, like, what we're going to do with them. Okay. Just that, skills yeah. and yeah. skills and interest, and then yeah. your skills and interest, and then we'll talk about them. Yeah. Okay. Because they're, they're going to work together in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's important to get that whole picture. So skills uh, on my end here would be marketing, communications, uh, journalism, uh, interviewing, uh, being able to interview people and um, kind of extract information and stories um, and kind of as a, as a recorder of stories as well. Um, then there's kind of physical fitness. So... I'm very much into running, you know, lifting weights, kind of staying, staying in uh, shape, um, nutritional sort of uh, skills, um, cooking and, and baking and things like that. Um, I think some other skills. That's are, like the big one. Yeah, those are those are probably those the main the main easy. skills. Interests would be um, things like writing. Um, I guess you could include things like, uh, gardening, but like also thinking about the specific parts of gardening that you like. So whether it's like the planting or the, you yeah, know, weeding or the mulching or the composting. Uh, composting. Um, so I guess we can kind of speak to how we kind of divvy up those, uh, based on what we like to do. Um, I really like taking care of the chickens probably more than the rabbits mm -hmm. per se. Um, interests also include, uh, I'm trying to think if I'm missing any. That's a good start. Yeah. I feel okay. like those. So mine are music, obviously that's my trade is I'm a musician, mm -hmm. but also teaching music. Um, and well, I won't go into what we could do with all that. So <laughs> teaching music, playing music, um, farming and gardening, and just raising food and building homesteads. Designing homesteads is something I really love the design process part of. I really just love the, the permaculture process of design. Um, I I have medical Drawing. some some medical training from the National Guard. Um, I was a, a healthcare specialist, combat medic, and that's now playing out. I joined the local fire department. Um, and so I, I enjoy that, and I also have that, you know, that skill set, and I, I went and got the certification for that and everything. So that's just one in the back, in the back pocket. Um, I enjoy teaching in general. Um, yeah. I, as as a musician, I also like events, and I've I've 
learned a lot about what makes an event work and what makes an event or an event space work or not work. Um, I've had like a decade of really seeing inside of venues and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I like, I also like ideas. I like entrepreneurship, the idea phase. I really don't like the work part. I just like the idea phase. Um, but that is an important thing to think about is like, you know, how can I make it so I can just really always be have, pursuing new ideas? Yeah. So with all of those. And drawing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah drawing, Go painting back. kind of stuff. It's a, it's a uh, like my last album, I, I did some of the artwork on that. So with all of those things in mind and all of those interests, um, and also like security and stuff like that, you know, I, the military stuff comes in, some of that's pretty valuable knowledge and we've gotten kind of related skills like the tracking class we took the other day mm -hmm. through the fire department. So with all of that in mind, what we want to do is think about all of those things we can do and look at our physical space, our five acres that we're building on and think about, and, and the surrounding community and think about how do we build a plan in real space and in internet space and all of that. Um, how do we build something to, to, so that can make so we can do all of those things we like to do and that we're good at doing mm -hmm. and, and monetize them because those are, those are things that come naturally to us. So it's, it's this whole idea of patterning everything after nature. If we do the things that are in our nature that we are made to do, yeah. It, it, the, since I've started never, to kind of have that approach, like things are just either. falling into, pro into place financially yeah. a lot better than when I was like hitting against the wall trying to like force things. Trying so, to like network and do. Yeah. So let's talk about like, so for yours, um, for writing looking at the broader community more than the homestead uh, or for let's just talk about content creation you know from videos to writing to interviewing you know we're creating finding country which is a media brand um the homestead is going to play into that because everything our whole homestead is content you know we're, mm -hmm. we're out here on this property too filming constantly we'll be out of that place filming constantly um and of course we're designing the house around that. We're designing one of the rooms to be the office office space that's also gonna have all of the audio equipment we need and that I need for music as well. Um, and it's gonna have kind of like, it's the setting is right for writing. We're gonna build cabins too that they'll also be Airbnbs, but they'll also be writing spaces that will be inspirational. Um, so we're designing that into the property. Um, and then also as we build this community in the community, as we reach out to like community organizations, we may do writing classes. Um, you may reach out and do marketing, marketing through them. classes, help with small businesses in the area. And a lot of these connections start with our farm too. Like they start with us meeting other like-minded homesteaders. We go to seed swaps. And so it's, it's our, it's the things we're producing from our farm. We're made like the other day we went to a seed swap and we sold some stuff for a, a few bucks. You know, we were selling some, some bread that Gabby mm -hmm. made and some plants off of the land. And we only made a few actual dollars, you know, financial capital, but also we made really good connections to some folks in our community. And mm -hmm. that since played out in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, actually one of them recommended me for a gig. Um, mm -hmm. So you never know how that stuff's going to play out. Um, so we're kind of trying to use the property and the house to steer revenue in. Uh, a big thing we're doing is working on doing an event venue, sort of an event venue, more like a farm to table thing on our five acres because I really want to bring my musical interests back to the home. I don't want to have to drive into Nashville or go on the road all the time to, to yeah. get money from performing music. So I'm thinking, how can I bring this back to me? So we're building this event space where we can have weekly or monthly farm to table dinners and we'll charge for those. We'll have live music. We'll, we'll produce the food off of our own farm. Oh, cooking is another skill that we both do in life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll cook and it'll be small, you know, 25 to 50 people. And that we'll also have the Airbnbs and we'll have the hit camps on the property. So we'll have campsites, we'll have cabins. And this is all that we can do this all in just five acres on a really small scale, but we, we want more acres to do on a large scale, but we can build our way up. So that's another thing. If yeah. you're going to move homesteads, you can build your way up. You, you build a model that you can take with you to different levels. You know, we're working here on this three quarters of an acre site doing all the same things. We'll do it all on the five acre site. And if we get 20 acres, 40 acres down the road, we'll do it all there too. Yeah. So we're designing When we design the property, we think of all of that. We're putting a farm stand on the road end of the property, and that's where we'll sell a surplus. Um, we're making sure we have the technology designed in. Um, everything we build, we're focusing on aesthetics, or that's our excuse to focus on mm -hmm. aesthetics, is that we're using his content. So we want the aesthetics to be right. So we're trying to not build things like totally practical. I mean, practical, but also, you know, think about beauty and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, we're designing the property around the live music, around the, the barbecues and, and farm to table dinners that we're going to have. We're designing the parking and the driveway to hold a uh, a camper so we can have uh, an RV site to rent out. And that'll bring in significant passive income. Uh, I'm designing space eventually. We haven't, I haven't figured out where this is going to be, but I'll have a space that will be my teaching studio. Because right now I'm driving all over yeah. the county to teach kids music. 
and the driving is just not worth it for them because I'm keeping the price really affordable so the kids out here can afford that. But I need to bring that into the homestead more. The more I, the less I can drive, the more I make. The more I save, the more I make. I don't want to pour money into my car. And what if something happened to oil or something? Yeah. Gas goes way up. The more I can bring, make people come to us, the better. And similarly, like with uh, my interest as far as exercise, bringing um, an exercise studio, yeah. you know, cre- um, having a, a sort of place that people can come actually to and using the homestead as um, an exercise facility, really. So yeah. um, we're working on trails um, on the five acres mm-hmm. that I can walk, run on, um, you know, there's, it's very hilly, so it will yeah. be a good workout for people. <laughs> and, and we talk <laughs> about all these things so. constantly about like, how can we like, like, okay, you need trails for your side of the business. How can I bring that into maybe if we're building an Airbnb cabin, I can market yeah. that to my music writing friends. I know a lot of publishing companies up and down music row. I can say, Hey, send your, your writers out here. Since everyone's going to be strapped for cash, maybe you normally send them to Hawaii, Yeah, <laughs> send them out to the cabin in the woods here. It'll be a little cheaper. So and I can build the trails as part of the marketing. Like there's trails, if you can, and same with the Airbnb and the hip camps. The trails are capital. That's, I guess, we would say material capital mm-hmm. in a way. Um, we put our labor labor into it and transform the property to to be an experience. Yeah. So those are all like kind of like have nothing to do with actually growing food, and those are all revenue generation things. And if each one brings in a hundred dollars a week or two hundred dollars a week, you have a lot of these micro streams of income, mm-hmm. and that gets really significant really fast. Right now, my income primarily comes from music performance, uh, teaching music, um, occasionally just working at all the farms around here. I always tell all the farmers, like, if you need a hand, just call me, even if it's only 10 bucks an hour or something. Yeah. Um, I just want to be there for them as well and offer my labor if, I'm, if I have the time and learn things and, and, just, and help get that yeah. food to be produced. Um, some farm stuff, a little, little trickle of that, um, homestead design. And we're just trying to increase those micro streams, increase what's coming in and get more diverse, get more things coming in. Yeah. Um, like Gabby still has a day job at the moment, but you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen in this market with jobs. So we really want to. And we're just, yeah. And just using it to transition over to, cause it helps to have a day job to help you, uh, kind of speed up your other <laughs> aspects that you're, that you're trying to build, you yeah. know? So, so we, you know, have projected out, you know, within the next year, can, could I get out of this, you know, day job and work, working for someone else? And so that's kind of how we devise the rest of our plans on the homestead is mm-hmm. we set kind of a target date for where do we want to yeah. be? Where do we want to be individually? And where do we want to be as a, as a couple too? Um, and we use that to kind of figure out which stage of all these plans that we're talking about right now we should yeah. work on next. So like kind of speaking to Mary's question, um, when do we project that we'll have the B and B and farm to table ready? Um, we're honestly like in the next couple of weeks looking to get, um, you know, hip camp stuff set up. So, and we're doing it in stages that that we can, so that's another, this whole business of that farm to table thing. We're doing this just, we don't want to wait until we can do everything we want. So we don't have the budget to build an Airbnb cabin right now, but we can make a campsite. Mm-hmm. We can make a couple of campsites and put those on hip camp. And it's practice for mm-hmm. us. And, and maybe we don't have all of the develop. legal things figured out for a farm to table dinner, you know, and the liability insurance and all of that. But we can have a fire department fundraiser and have a couple dozen friends from the neighborhood come. Mm-hmm. And we're not raising money for ourselves, but we're learning how to do this farm to table thing. And we're showing the community what we do. And we're building tons of um, social capital and we're funding the fire department that we're on. Like we, yeah. we need equipment <laughs> really bad. Yeah. And we're also trying to prove something, which is that you can, uh, basically we're building an agorist fire department, not building <laughs> it already exists, but like, you know, can we fund this without government? Uh, mm-hmm. And so far it looks like that. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, so that covers like kind of what we're doing on the business end. So hopefully that inspires you to start thinking like, what do I love working with wood? Do I, am I good at organizing people? Do I like cleaning things? A lot of things that people kind of like look down upon, like cleaning things. Like if it, I know people that really enjoy, like my mom loves cleaning. Mm-hmm. Not me. I didn't get that yeah. gene, but uh, <laughs> she loves cleaning. So she does, she cleans houses for a live for not for a living, but just she, she has plenty of income, but she just does that as a side thing because she enjoys it and she makes extra money. Makes extra money. Um, so it can be things that seem like maybe you really like collecting trading cards of, Baseball. I don't know. About trading cards. <laughs> maybe you really love, or you love banned Pokemon cards. And yeah. so maybe you start a Pokemon YouTube channel or you, you have a side hustle selling all of that. Or um, you put, or you, you know, find rare collectibles and you auction them off mm-hmm. on 
but in Facebook terms of services and then yeah. physical goods, there's so much any person can produce. There's nobody that doesn't have any interests. Yeah. I mean, I guess there are some people like that and they're just watching TV and eating Doritos all day, but I don't think anybody on this channel is like that. So yeah. Cause like really what, what finding country magazine for me is right now is just what I enjoy doing. I'm a journalist at heart and I'm, I'm a writer and I just, I love writing and interviewing mm -hmm. people and helping people share their stories. So, um, when I get off work at, you know, my nine to five, I'm not like watching TV or, you know, doing some other mind numbing activity. I'm scheduling interviews. I'm calling people. I'm going to people's farms or going to their, you know, businesses and I'm, I'm interviewing them. I'm learning more about their stories and I'm turning it into a digital magazine that I hope to one day make physical. But um, right now it's a digital magazine and it's a product. It's a product that I could sell, but I'm strategically not selling it right now. And we can sell other things through it from our homestead. I can sell like, that's what's cool about like this channel and stuff. Eventually when I get my rootstock going, uh, I'll talk more about that later, but like I can use my content creation to sell the things from my farm. I'll hold off on that stuff though, because I want to make that a whole addition towards the end here, where we talk about the thing, the, oh, okay. the traditional ahead, farm sorry. thing. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> uh, real quick, I just want to catch up on a few comments here. But that after these comments, what, what we'll talk about is like, okay, oh, we've talked about the business things. Now, what are the the, the normal, traditional, like actual physical goods that we produce off of the homestead, <laughs> um, and how are we going to sell those? What are those? And we'll talk about that more. But yeah, do do think about that. What what do you do? What do you like? What are you good at? What do you want to learn? You know, maybe you don't have a skill, but you've been like looking at blacksmithing and you're like, okay, could I make this profitable? And I would say you can always carve out a market for something you like if you're really willing to work. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of questions about Holly. That's who it is here. <laughs> Holly, she's part Aussie, part lab. Unfortunately, she's mostly Aussie. I was hoping she'd turn out to be more of a lab, but uh, she's becoming a better dog. Uh, how old is she now? She is 10 months about. So almost, almost to that year mark. Yeah, she's a clown. <laughs> Um, beautiful dog says turning guns. Thank you. <laughs> Show me the dog. <laughs> That's always me. Like, I want to see the puppy. Uh, a JT says, I'm really digging your work the mountain song. Thank you. I appreciate that. That one's about my uh, grandpa, not the moonshining grandpa, the other grandpa that actually did honest work. He was a logger. <laughs> I did just enough logging in Oregon to realize like, man, I don't want a real job. I'm going to learn how to play guitar. <laughs> um, oh, and we already answered Mary's question there. Yeah. Aesthetic, Frecklebeard says, aesthetic is important, but I would think that homesteading is difficult to have a nice aesthetic all the time. Sometimes it can be less than pretty. What aesthetic are you going for? Good, fair question. Um, aesthetics are hard. It's hard to like, as we all know, like your farm is like 90% of a farm is basically tarps and wires yeah. <laughs> and containers. It's like so much more like plastic and junk. I don't want to look at, but you have to like find places to hide it. Um, but basically we're just prioritizing trying to be as aesthetic as possible. Um, so maybe we have some rain barrels. Maybe we choose to paint them something other than blue that goes with the landscape. Yeah. Um, and maybe we're spending a tiny bit more money on our siding on our house to look a little bit nicer because we may en end up Airbnb being the house itself. Um, and maybe as we make choices regarding trails and fields and just the different parts, we'll we'll, we'll make decisions based on like we have, Yeah, like we have, um, like speaking of using the kind of living, res you know, living capital that you have, um, or maybe that was material, I forget what you said, mm -hmm. but like rocks, um, we used rocks on our property and we create um, little paths for the entrances of trails. So yeah. maybe we're not lining the whole trail with rocks, yeah. but we're, you know, just having the entrance be that way. So honestly, um, really we, using a lot, a lot of our natural yeah, resources. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we're not like honest. spending money. We're, it's, there's a fine line. We're not trying to manicure this place, but we're going to market it is what it is, which is a permaculture yeah. farm. So it's, it's, it's not that we're not going to look with... chaotic like a permaculture farm, but like we're going to maybe hide the, the garbage <laughs> and the, <laughs> you know, the boneyard, you know, we might focus on an outbuilding to put stuff in and really hide our chaos that we all have. Yeah. Cause like real farming, real homesteading is messy. It's, it's inevitable. Um, if you're living a real life and you don't have a bunch of money to just clean things up with, then it's, it's tough. Um, but it's, it gives us an excuse to focus on it because we're both artists at heart. So we mm -hmm. really want to focus on aesthetics anyway. Yeah. Homesteading the Heartland made. Hey, good to see you. He's, mm -hmm. uh, Hey everyone, sorry late. Was busy with kids, baths <laughs> outside all weekend. Yeah, I get it. We're tired. Um, we did sort of take a day off, but <laughs> did plenty of work in the garden. We went and got a load of hay. We got some nice, good organic hay. Um, we're very blessed to have a, a, a local family that's been farming here for generations, and they grow they grow their hay organically, no persistent herbicides. So we've actually kind of designed some of our systems temporarily around that mm -hmm. because I want to bring that fertility onto my land right now. 
the hay, and that goes right into the rabbits, which produce manure, and then some of this hay gets soiled, so that hay and that manure goes and it becomes my compost and my mulches that are creating so much abundance in the rest of my farm. Eventually, I am going to dial that out and not buy hay. Eventually, I want a completely self-sufficient system. But in the meantime, it's cheap. I'm supporting a great local farmer. They're great people. I enjoy the connection with them. Yeah. We have fun going out and bucking hay. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we fit it all in a minivan today, so it wasn't, yeah. that, it wasn't that tough to, to haul. But, uh, yeah, good to see a homestead in the heartland. Uh, Stephanie's in here, too. Hello, Stephanie. Uh, there's a lot of Tennessee people I really need to contact with. Uh, I do have the Sovereign Village Project email, sovereignvillageproject at gmail.com, and I know I'm way behind. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, we're doing a thousand things. Yeah. So I'm doing my best to keep up with everybody, but do expect me to be slow in responses. Uh, okay, so we're at the 40 minute mark. So we've talked about what we're doing as far as like our interests and how to use the homestead to monetize those interests. Um, but let's talk now about the more traditional homestead things. What are the foods and the, and the natural things that are coming off of our property? And how do we responsibly and carefully sell them while still making sure we're bringing fertility back to the land? One reason we like the farm to table model so much is that <laughs> this may sound gross, but you know, people who, when they're staying the weekend, they're peeping and poop pooing in a, a composting toilet or into the septic system and that fertility stays on the land because if you're taking all of your food products off your land you need a way to replace that sustainably or else you're losing it so we actually want to keep that on the land in a way um now we're not doing human manure or anything like that we just have a septic i've done a video about that on the channel that's like designed to be harvested back into our animal systems and we'll eventually probably with the cabins we'll have composting toilets but we're going to do that as hands off as possible. I don't want to yeah. be hauling buckets of other people's, you know what? Mm -hmm. um, but we do want that fertility to stay on the land. And so that's an important consideration as we figure out how to sell things is, is either we need to keep the fertility on the land or, and have it consumed on site, or we need to replace it. So when I bring in hay from another site, I'm kind of replacing that fertility. Um, we're working on ideas like maybe a community compost thing. I know one guy out here, he, he has his neighbors come bring him all of their compost. They all save their compost from the houses and they're large families. So there's a lot of compost. So all their food scraps and then he gives them eggs for free. So he still gets way plenty of eggs. He can yeah, still sell some for cash, thing. but he's getting lots of free compost. So we're trying to think of systems like that to bring free fertility. And we might talk to some restaurants and, you know, I'm trying to avoid having to chase food all day long and chase scraps, but. Yeah. Really what you're trying to do with anything um, as far as, you know, marketing your homestead or making a profit off of it is you're trying to solve other people's problems. So mm -hmm. take an assessment of what you have, you know, kind of like what, whether it's, you know, what resources do you have on the land or what vegetables you're growing or what, whatever um, you're producing using your soil, um, but also your skills and your interest and think, how can I use a combination of those or one of those mm -hmm. to solve someone else's problem? So really think about, um, your, your kind of local people that you can help solve their problems, but also think about on the grander scheme of things with um, things like content. How can you solve a problem for people yeah. nationally or globally? So that's what we're always thinking about when we're creating content is like I can use a local story and extract a national um, or just more generic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, theme from it. And I can also take something that's happening at the national level and make it a local, you know, story or make it have a local angle. So um, that's just like my approach to content is how can I, uh, you know, leverage both of these to create something totally yeah. different and something totally valuable that's not, you know, that also, uh, solving a problem for people. Yeah. That also made me think of something to, before we go get back to like the farming part of things, um, creating content. We talk about that a lot because we are artists. She's a writer. I'm a musician. We've already, we were already doing that before we started living like this. Mm -hmm. However, that's something that a lot more people can do a lot more people than, than real. Yeah. like, for example, Gabby just interviewed somebody for finding country or mm -hmm. was it for the other thing that he did? He wrote a book called Barnwood speaks. Oh yeah. So I, yeah. And, was... and he, the guy, he'd never read a book. Yeah, Literally. but he wrote he never, one. But, <laughs> and it but, was, it's good. I, and, but I he was talking it. about his craft. Yeah. And so that might be, so whatever, if you get good at something, you absolutely can create some kind of content. Maybe like if it's blacksmithing, you become a master at that. And then you can teach that. You can make online content. You can make a book about it. Now, not everyone needs to be a content creator for sure. But no. it's, it's, it's but a it's bigger, more, more democratized field than people realize. Yeah, I think people get scared and, and yeah. think they aren't, you know 
Because as you know, like we're not all that, that professional around here. We're yeah. pointing a phone at our faces and just talking. Like we don't really have a lot in terms of resources. We don't yet. Yeah. You know, we want good microphones and cameras, and we're trying to get there. But we're we're just working with what we got. Yeah. Um, and it's working for us. You know, we've made great connections and great. And we made sales and stuff through this channel, and that's all with just a point and shoot phone. So really, anybody can do this. But okay, let me get back to the. Um, so we want to. Our model is now. There's market gardening. There's a million ways to sell produce off your land and to, be, and to be more intentional about it we're really taking the opposite approach i'm being unintentional about what i sell I, like i was talking about earlier i want to sell whatever the surplus is and i want to work as little as possible yeah so i really like the annual succession planting method for my annual bed so next spring i'm going to take that to a much larger scale now that i've kind of like figured out what system works with my personality and my schedule i'm going to try to really expand that and so i think by next year i can have we already have about as much vegetable food as we can eat so by next year i think i can have a lot more to sell um and by sell i mean we can use it for farm to table dinners we can sell it at our farm stand we could sell we it as a, as a like specialized csa yeah where and that's like where we're, we're starting saying, to get more advanced stuff yeah where you're saying like um you know we would have our own angle for that where mm -hmm. we would say you know each week you get something different mm -hmm. and this is where we could bring in our our love of cooking is this is like just what we do now. We just pick stuff from the garden and create something yeah. out of it. So um, we'll have, you know, a whole repository of different sort of cooking ideas mm -hmm. that, and, and baking ideas that we can send in the CSA. Yeah. So you're adding more value and showing people how to use your product, which is. And basically another. we will market the fact that we're a permaculture farm. It's like, yeah, you're not going to know what you're going to get every month. Like you yeah. might get <laughs> plums and tomatoes. Now we'll try to have a diverse blend of vegetables and of fruit and meats and eggs or wh however we do it, it will, will, when we get to that stage, um, we still want to provide a real meal, but then we'll provide them the recipes. We'll provide them with like, okay, here's how to actually use all of this food. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a great system because like whether that's a farm stand or, and that could also just on a smaller scale, you could just have a Facebook page or some kind of social media page or an email list. That's the best one of all or a text chain and just say, Hey guys, here's what I have this week or this month. Come out, come and get it. Um, so that there's a lot of different ways to sell what you have. There's also delivery. You could and CSA could be delivery, you know, mm -hmm. community supported agriculture. Um, you can do food deliveries. You could have drop sites. There's a billion different ways to market the food that comes off your land. Um, but we also have a lot of other things that come off of our land, a lot of other interests that we can take that produce and use it. So, for example, um, I come from a family that did a lot of those mountain activities. Like, um, let's say uh, they make essential oils from corn um, in a still. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I come from definitely that, and we live here in Keg County, Tennessee, is what it's colloquially known as. Um, and moonshining is a big part of what goes on here. So that's you know a way where there's a lot of brandy that there's a lot of fruits. I'm not so I don't have a lot of corn on this land, but there's a lot of eventually going to be a lot of fruit. Um, and I've got a lot of connections with the music industry to where like people really like having a jar of that around for a party or something, and it, it's harmless and safe. And um, I craft it very carefully to be very much safer than what you buy in a store. Um, and I really don't care what the law is. You know, it's what I'm producing off my land. I have the right to sell it, and I'll I'll defend that right. Mm -hmm. So that's that's something I can produce and sell. Um, you know, a lot of people get into the cannabis stuff because that's it's almost like you want to get in on that while the while it's, it's still illegal. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's something where I, I certainly would see no moral problem with that. It's medicine that certainly can be abused. But you know, why shouldn't you sell medicine? Why should big pharma be able to sell medicine? They killed a lot more people than I have. Um, I'm not doing that on a, any commercial scale or anything like that. Just to be clear. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something a lot of people do. And as an agorist, I, I think that's perfectly moral and, and a correct thing to do. Um, perennial cuttings, that's a big one. Yeah. So we're planting out as much perennial abundance as we can. Every single perennial fruit tree, nut tree, shrub that we can find, anything that looks like it might work on our property, we plant. Yeah. So right now we're just focusing on diversity. But by next year and the year after that, I'm gonna start having a lot of root cuttings I can take. Um, I can take root cuttings, I can take regular cuttings, and some of them produce seeds from their fruit. And I'll start a nursery with those. And so I can sell the full grown plants, you know, in person through a CSA or at a farm yeah. stand or at events. But I can also sell the root stocks through something like this channel. And I can, things that I can mail and seeds I can sell in that way. And seeds from your annual garden as well. We save seeds from everything. Yeah. Um, we don't want to deal with a lot of processing of seeds, but if we have too many seeds, we'll sell them. We probably won't. We might sell them online. More likely, we'll just do seed swaps and give them to our friends and neighbors. Um, but that's something that come off the land. Uh, processed foods. 
in Gabby's case, it's baking. So we're going to incorporate not just grains, but you know, what fruits do we have today? She made some amazing muffins that have carrots and mm -hmm. apples and different mm -hmm. fruits and vegetables in them. Um, and that can also all be incorporated into our farm to table stuff, of course, but into mm -hmm. a, a sellable product, jams, jellies, sauces, um, wines, and keep in mind from an agorist perspective, like selling wine can be, you could be making, let's say you make a great muscadine wine. That could be a significant income stream. You could sell a few bottles of that, you know, make 50 to a hundred dollars a week. That could be really significant with as one of your micro in, streams of income without getting on the radar. You know, obviously when you're selling alcohol, you're dealing with tyrannical government regulation. Um, but you keep things within a certain scale and it's just like not enforced. Um, so that's important to remember when in regards to wine, homemade beers, um, even some foods, things like raw milk. Um, it is moral and correct for you to break the law. You should break immoral laws. And that's what laws that tell you what you can and cannot sell off of your farm. Um, natural things, that those are immoral laws that should be openly broken. I open, I don't hide that I'm doing them because it's a form of protest. So I absolutely, you know, have no qualms about any of that stuff. Selling raw milk is illegal in a lot of states. If I have a cow, I'm going to sell raw milk. Um, but you can do those things at a small scale to where you're not, you really, nothing's getting enforced for the most part. Um, when it comes to animals, of course, you have the meat. If you're raising chickens, you'd be selling meat. You'd be selling the eggs. But what you, if you're raising chickens, you might consider, you know, maybe segregating some of the breeds and letting the roosters breed with the hens. And you sell the actual chickens. You could sell the breeding stock. If you're raising sheep, why process that sheep and slaughter it? Yeah. You could just sell it as breeding stock. That's why we try to only bring really good breeding stock onto the land and be really intentional. After Holly, if we get any more dogs, they're probably going to be livestock guardian yeah. dogs, mm -hmm. and we'll get. We'll get good breeding stock and we'll get a male and female pair. If we're going to be feeding them and we're going to have them on the land, they're going to be an asset. So we'll breed them and we'll produce good, good yeah. quality farm puppies. Um, and you can get fibers, you know, rabbits, sheep produce fibers for clothing for your own use or for sale. Um, and a variety of, you know, with rabbits, it can be everything from rabbit's feet to the hide. Um, uh, you can sell bones. You can sell antlers. Holly's chewing on a bone that we paid for right now. Um, there's a lot of products you can sell off an animal. You can be selling um, tannin. There's, there's specific like compounds that come from animals that are used in like what's the what's the one you use to make cheese? Oh gosh, rennet. Yeah, rennet. that's that that's a, that comes from I think like the fat of an animal. Uh, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. not too well versed on that, but like that's a product that could be sold to to people who are making specialty cheeses. Um, we have established foraged things that we sell or can sell. Um, for example, I'm, I'm going to start taking uh, cuttings from my edible sumacs and I'll start <clears> selling those because a lot of regions don't have them as abundantly as they grow here. And sumacs are great. It's a fun fruit tree. It makes like a sour lemonade like drink and you can make wine out of it. The leaves can actually be smoked like a tobacco. Um, it's an incredibly useful native plant here. Um, I have some friends down the road. They, they forage. They have a lot, they have about five acres. Of, it's mostly grass. It was like just an old hobby farm at one point. But they left, even though they're permaculture people, they left most of that in grass because she sells medicinal herbals. And there's a lot of things like plantain that grow really well in disturbed soil, which is what a lawn is. So they let those get big and get, get to the flowering stage and they propagate those and probably even fertilize them. She goes out and she collects them and makes tinctures and various mm -hmm. herbal medicines. And she does a brisk business selling them. Yeah, um, she has them in different local stores like mm -hmm. uh, next County over. Um, she sells them at any sort of seed swaps we have or any events and all of these things as you So another one would be timber You know, we have a lot of timber a lot of lumber on the land a lot of trees We're leaving as many trees as we can so we need to we do need to monetize the trees because we're sacrificing a lot of good garden space for trees Yeah, we can use them of course on our own projects. That's hugely yeah, we can use right now That's saving us cutting, a lot because yeah, like the prices costs. because of the hyperinflation hitting lumber um, but I can sell if I have just a lot of time and out there, out there with the chainsaw, I might just sell firewood. I actually put myself partially through college selling firewood because mm -hmm. that was an abundant resource. And if I have a sawmill, I can lumber specific dimensional num lumber. Or you could make specific projects. Maybe you're making martin housing for birds that eat mosquitoes or you're building chicken coops or something like that. A, a big consideration is you're figuring out what to do with the surplus. When you have surplus foods, surplus fuel, timbers, animal surplus, you have to think. What do I need more right now? Do I need more time or do I need more financial capital? If you need financial capital you have time, maybe you go ahead and you process. You slaughter that chicken, you process it, and you sell it for high dollar permaculture, you know, grass fed meat. You get a high dollar for that. You're going to make way more than just selling the bird live. Yeah. But maybe you're busy and you don't want to, so maybe you want to sell a lot. Same with lumber. 
maybe I just don't, I don't want to sit there. I don't want to use a chainsaw a lot because chainsaws are dangerous. It doesn't matter how safe I feel with a chainsaw. Every time I use it, I have a chance of cutting off my arm. So I really don't want to do a lot of chainsawing for money. Uh, it's sacrilegious coming from a logging family, but um, I want to mostly cut for my own needs. So if I'm selling timber off the land, it's probably not going to be firewood. I'm probably not going to sit there and chop up cords and cords of firewood all day long. Um, I'll more likely just sell the timber and get a lower price for that. Just mm -hmm. sell the whole tree if I can. Um, so it's, you just have to determine what fits your situation best. Maybe you love cutting lumber. Maybe you, you find it meditative and so you want to do it that way. So with all of the foods and all of the animals and all of the different products that come off your land, even rocks, I mean, everything, first of all, you should see as a potential resource to bring in capital. But then you decide, like, do I want to process it more and make more money? But really, you're just trading your time for money. Or do I want to process it less? Um, and there's other ways to sell things, include meals. You could just, if you're a great cook, why not start a home business and just make a bunch of meals and sell them to your neighbors? Um, with baked goods, there's hardly any laws on any of that. There's a lot of cottage industry laws that make it really easy to do um, if you're trying to follow the law. Uh, I don't. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that, those kinds of things. And, and man, it's just, it's it's limitless. The things and, that you can do also, off of a property and just out of a human's brain, the amount of things that you have and skills and talents that any person has yeah. that can be expanded upon, of course. Like knowledge, you have to keep, you have to keep getting smarter. <laughs> but, man, and there's so much abundance on a piece of land. We're already finding that. And that's just five acres. And, and beyond that, um, also looking at how you can partner with other farms in your area yeah so like maybe there's a cattle company you know that that is close to you and maybe there's an opportunity where you could create you know a product together whether it's like um like maybe th there's a cattle company and dairy company that could make charcuterie boards or something mm. and i don't know maybe you can add carrots to it and you sell it at you know a local festival or something i don't know just what ways that you can get creative and actually use the farms around you and not look at them as competition, but look yeah. at them as actual you partners. Know, partners. Yeah. I think one way we're doing that is we're talking to some local farmers about a co-op um, and we're looking at a building, but we're also like, we can form this co-op without a building, just find all the interested homesteaders who, what we're trying to do is partner with homesteaders who want to do farmsteading, which is the idea of like, it's your homestead and you're selling the surplus. Yeah. So it's a much more scaled down. That's where partnering with people is so important because like, we're just not going to, in these next few years, we're not going to produce that much volume. Yeah. Of it's how food. you can scale without. Yes. Yeah, so you can scale without scaling. So yeah. if you can find all the like-minded people, then you can create a space where there's reliably always going to be a lot of produce. And that means that there's more likelihood that there's always going to be tomatoes and lettuce and the various things that the consumer wants. And so by doing a co-op, you're providing more of that grocery store experience where like they're more guaranteed to find what they need. It's like farmer's markets are a really flawed model to me because it's, it's unreliable. It's there once a week. Excuse me. You don't know what's going to be there. It's not like, not that all farmers markets are bad. They're, they're good, but they're better than nothing, but they're not necessarily addressing like a realistic way for people to get really most of their food directly from the farmers. Yeah. So co-ops are a great way to do that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. we got a few more comments here. Mm -hmm. Apparently having some, were a lot of people having trouble with the buffering? Uh-oh, I didn't know we were buffering. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, uh, <laughs> I think just a couple. Hopefully times. we're not buffering now. Yeah. Let's see the last uh, comments here. All right, let's see. Where do we got? Aesthetic. Uh, Homesteading. I have about 15, mm -hmm. 20 years on you guys. That's <laughs> uh, Mary. Homesteading. We talked homesteading in the heartland. We talked about putting small, tiny homes out here and doing an Airbnb or something, but I was late and don't know what all I missed. Um, but well, we're going to cover more and more of that. Too. Oh, late. We, we're going to, as we do this, everything we do on our farm, we're going to make content. It'll be on Finding Country, uh, findingcountry.com, and there's a YouTube channel. Uh, and there's a magazine. It's, Gabby's magazine is like really good. Mm -hmm. like, her stories are so in depth. The amount of like, those stories really matter for those of us that are trying to do this. So great story. Yeah. Um, Could be great. Connection. We're going to cover all of those things as we do them. So as we kind of, you know, we'll encounter pitfalls and problems and solutions and, and we'll, we'll put all of those out there. Um, but Airbnb and hip camp are two very accessible money making things for the property, especially right now. Like I don't remember the numbers, but I saw, I've seen several articles where they're way up rural type tourism like that. It's way up. People want to get out of the cities. Oh yeah. Um, hip camp is, I actually, um, one of my uh, kind of other revenue streams is I do ghost writing um, sort of stuff. So I'll write for other people 
And I had to do a whole article about hip camp and Mm -hmm. kind of really realized how much it exploded over the past year. Um, And it actually is a company that's, um, you know, buying up all these other companies uh, like in Australia who are doing kind of the same thing, but it's, it's really growing and scaling really quickly. And um, I think they said last year they were able to, so many people were doing hip camp and um, engaging in, in that ecosystem that they were able to pay, I think like double the amount that usually people who put their properties on there get. So Mm -hmm. people made, you know, twice as much money as they did the year before um, doing hip camp. Uh, And if you look at recent numbers from the KOA, uh, I think 10.1 million people started camping last year. So that's a huge increase. Like they were Mm -hmm. first time campers. And I think, you know, 80% of them or something crazy can plan to continue doing that into this year. And probably, you know, it could have created a whole family tradition for 10, you know, millions of people that you don't know. So um, it's definitely, I think, a a trend that that is booming and will continue to boom as things get a little crazier in the cities. Yeah, and it's good. And also, depending on how dystopic things get here in the near future, hip camps and airbnbs could turn into more permanent rentals if you have like a decent cabin that's sanitary and you've got like a really good composting toilet it may get to the point where like you're renting that out to somebody regularly it will probably get to that point really soon because this housing crisis is gonna hit like a freight train uh homesteading the heartland says that's a great idea on the compost thank you and that just gave me another idea you can sell Mm -hmm. compost Mm -hmm. worm castings rabbit compost a good mushroom compost are high value especially to gardeners in the city they will pay out the wazoo for that stuff so um, for me, I don't, I just need too much, like everything on my farm is determined by how much compost I can create. So right now I'm not selling any, but if you get to that point, compost is also a great way where let's say you have a bunch of rabbits. That's a great commercial sideline to get started on because you can just bring in hay and feed. Those are your costs and in your initial breeding stock. And then you can sell the rabbits. You can sell the manure and the manure can be a high dollar product. You can sell the rabbits as breeding stock You can sell them as meat. You can sell the furs. You can sell the feet. Um, you can sell the wool if they're wool rabbits. So there's like so many revenue streams from just one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Homestead Heartland says, talk it keeps buffering on my end. Yeah, sorry about the buffering. I wish it wasn't doing that. Mary says, the government mafia wants their cut. Yes, that's exactly what the government is. Turning Gun says, so you're a demi, see ya. I'm not sure, does that mean Democrat? I'm not sure what about me openly advocating uh, not paying taxes and breaking the law <laughs> is Democrat. Um, that's uh, like, Definitely, that's a weird kind of Democrat that talks about not paying taxes, but maybe I misunderstood that one. Uh, You can take the raw wood to a a mill and get wood in return. I bought a chainsaw mill for 35 bucks. Yeah, those little chainsaw mills, you can do great things with that. Um, Obviously, you're not going to be able to do all forms of lumber, but that's on my list. I have to get a different kind of chainsaw for that, too, but uh, that is definitely on my list of things to do. Gan says they dropped a few trees today. Man, there's nothing like cutting down trees. Like As a person who loves trees, I do it very carefully and very selective, but there's something just elemental about cutting down trees. Like I had the most fun clearing our home site. Like what, what could be more elemental and sacred than walking into a patch of the woods and just cutting down a spot for you and your family to live. Like that's such a, a cool experience that everybody should have. Mm-hmm. Uh, it takes a long time to dry if you're processing your own. Uh, I can't remember what we were talking about. Uh, there's an RV app that is allowing folks to offer RV remote sites from their own property. Oh, yeah. I'd love to know more about that, Stephanie. That's cool. Yeah, RV ownership increased. Yeah, increased so, I mean, there's a wave of people who are going to basically have RVs and nothing else, and everything they own will be in those RVs. So RVs, you know, you may be able to – it's also a way to maybe get around some laws and get it into your – and get it by, you know, make – obviously, you want to make sure you're being a good neighbor with the stuff. Um, that's a big yeah. consideration mm-hmm. for us is not pissing off our neighbors. We want to make – like, we're fortunate in that our five acres has two roads, one on each side. So we're trying to steer some of the traffic down one road, some of the traffic down. But like we might have some of the traffic for the Airbnb and hip camp down one side and for the farm to table stuff, it'll come down the other. So yeah. we're not bothering any of our neighbors too much with too much traffic, you know, because like I'm against zoning and all of that. But like you should think about if you're in a residential area, you should think about the quality of life of your neighbors and not be putting a smelting factory yeah. next to them or, <laughs> or doing anything like that. Yeah. Be a good neighbor. And, and maybe building, building some, capital. yeah, building some social capital by... Also, you know, we want to incorporate our neighbors into what we, this, yeah. this is a, this channel is about building community after all. We're already talking about, you know, one of our neighbors works with wood. So we're talking about if we form this co-op, how can we get his woodworking? 
we've got um, some great friends of ours that do leatherworking. We want to figure out like how can we make a marketplace in our county where people can buy all this stuff. So we want to incorporate all of those trades that are and encourage our neighbors to engage in trades more. We want to buy from them and encourage them to go on a commercial scale yeah. because the more successful and independent they are, the better off we all are. We want our whole neighborhood to be self-sufficient because we don't want hungry neighbors. Yeah. The prepper and me, like the, the, the thing the prepping movement gets wrong is telling people to hide everything. I don't let anyone know you're prepper. Don't let them know you have a garden, you know, because the raving mobs will come <laughs> and destroy everything. And it's like, that's, but it's like, then you're just isolating yourself and not you building can't, allies. And you so. can't stay awake all night. It's not going to happen. All the security mm -hmm. in the world is not going to stop a horde of people on your property. But what will stop a horde of people is a whole bunch of neighbors with walkie talkies and the various implements that they need to defend the land. So, Make your friends now. Who are also, you know, somewhat economically dependent on each other. Yeah. And, and like, right now, like, I throw my seedlings out into this neighborhood as fast as I can get them out there. Like, obviously, I, I need to reserve most of them for myself right now, but I'm trying to get my neighbors growing food as fast as I can. And it's it's working to some degree. Many of them are off and on, not as much as I'd like, but um, they're also learning how. And we talk, and I'm just always putting the bug in their ear, you know, no, without being annoying. Um just trying to get more food growing. Um, and we're also working on goals of, of planting out places in our community that are commu commons, commonly owned areas, like there's a community center. Um, there's so many churches and all of them have so much space that could be planted out. Mm -hmm. So as, as our home nursery gets bigger, we're gonna then start taking those cuttings and things like that, spreading them out in the community, giving them to neighbors, giving them to community organizations, and then we'll do gorilla planting as well. Gorilla planting is a great way, by the way, Gorilla planting, that's where you're like planting on an abandoned site or a roadway or somewhere, you know, where you can get away with it. And what's cool about that is that you can have living capital on somebody else's land. It can be government land or something like that, which is your land. But let's say there's a, a backside of a park that your property backs up to, or there's an underpass that nobody goes, nobody sees what's down there. So you're like, oh, I'll throw some fruit trees. Um, especially if you already have a home garden, it doesn't cost garden going, it doesn't cost you anything. So you throw some perennial edible stuff there. A lot of places that could sit there for five to 10 years, 20 yeah. years no, or forever. Nobody will ever disturb it. And not only can you go and have a secret stash of food there, um, <laughs> you could also go and take a bunch of cuttings. Um, and that's a way another, a lot of per permaculture people will give out seedlings on the condition. Like, hey, I'm going to come by in a year or two and take a bunch of cuttings. Um, my brother out in Oregon, he gets a lot of his blueberry and elderberry and plants like that from a local permaculture farm. And they give him free stuff because they know he's a he's a hardworking gardener. He's a really good gardener and he, he works really hard at it. So they know he's going to put in all that effort to really make their plant succeed. So they give him tons of free plants and they have a great relationship going. And then they come back, they take their cuttings. So they're farming his yard mm -hmm. and he's getting free plants. Like what a cool deal. And that's real capital. Like they, that guy expanded out his plants way faster because of that. And he has a constant has customer a and my brother. Customer, yeah. And my brother he will keep He will keep coming back even after. Like imagine if every like business transaction back. was that way instead of exploitative and, and just like mutually beneficial for everybody. Um, yeah. It's just a cool way to do things. My gosh, we're at an hour and seven minutes. <laughs> I said we wouldn't go late today and we did. So let's just check, see if we have any more comments. I think we're good. Um, boy, we covered a lot. We were just rapid fire getting through it. <laughs> but uh, we're very passionate about making money from your homestead. It's crucial. It's so important. Um, to be financially self-sufficient in these times. As we can see, our ability to make a living is going to be held hostage. So we need to be financially self-sufficient. And it's just better. Why not do the things you love all your life? Obviously, this is not a get-rich-quick stuff. Like, this isn't going to happen no, tomorrow. No, it's hard work. We're not there yet, we're, we're, but we're getting there. I, I'm All my income is self-sufficient now, but it's still reliant on things like Nashville, and it can be impacted by lockdowns and other tyrannical actions like that. Yeah, we're by no means there, but we're actively But we're moving towards there, and it's and getting better every day. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I hopefully that's inspiring to, to folks and gets you thinking along those lines. Um, do, I know I always say this, but like, we love seeing other people's ideas. So we need ideas too, but I, like, <laughs> I really want Sovereign Village Project, all of these videos to be a community and, and an exchange of information. So if you have good ideas, feel free to, once this video re-uploads, put them in the regular comments instead of the live stream. Cause then people can kind of like comment on your comment and you know, that's, it's good to do some comments there. Um, we'll do a lot more videos about that. We're going to create a lot of content. We're going to create like part of the business we're creating here is Gabby's going to figure out how to like package how to market your homestead. How We're going to test mm -hmm. out these concepts. Then we're going to make them easy for people to do. We'll set up systems and websites to like yeah. make this really accessible because we all need to be jump-starting this, get self-sufficient, build the skills, build our community, build our trade networks. Um, and it's fun. It's so much fun. I've had more, I've never had this much fun. Mm -hmm. Like building a, your own little 
empire. And from yeah. a prepping perspective, it's really fun because it's a piece of this puzzle you're trying to figure out. I was like, if I had nothing, if there was no civilization, could I still thrive? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the answer is yes. We just all need to be working to get there. So, <laughs> Everyone, thank you so much for joining. Great comments. We've uh, enjoyed everybody in here. Love you all. Stay safe, be well, and happy homesteading.